All right, welcome to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin, and this is Lecture 9, XML Schema. So a couple of comments about past projects before diving into tonight's material. So note, if you haven't already, that what we tend to do so that you, if interested, can learn from each other's works or can see other ways of implementing the same problems, do note that on the projects page of the website, we do post some sample solutions. These aren't necessarily meant to be perfect solutions, but you'll note that we took Fernando's and Jeffrey's for Project 2, Michael's for Project 1, and offer them up with those students' permissions uh, as sample approaches to those problem sets. So if you'd like to take a look at how someone else did it, by all means, do take a peek. And we'll continue to exhibit some students' work for those. Uh, also bear in mind the schedule for the final project, the pre-proposal. And actually, I should apologize. I clearly did not realize three months ago when I wrote the syllabus that Thursday the 22nd is Thanksgiving. Um, I'll just get out of that by saying at least you had three months to submit the pre-proposal before then. Um, but my apologies if uh, some of you were scrambling to do that on Thanksgiving. That was not the intention. So um, the proposal, though, is due on a non-holiday in a couple of weeks' time. So do keep that in mind and certainly engage us in conversation. Note, too, that what we've kept is a little archive of past students' projects. Um, know that these are meant to be inspirational or just to give you a sense of what uh, kinds of ideas you yourself might think about if you're still trying to decide what you might want to do. Um, you can certainly do something similar or identical in spirit to what some past students have done. Again, we really just offer it up there as a list of ideas, if, if only to get the juices flowing. So do take a look at that if you would like. All right, so last time we looked at two major topics. Uh, XQuery and DTD. Uh, in a nutshell, what was what's XQuery all about? Someone who's eating pizza and thus owes me something. <laughs> what's XQuery? Oh, we're putting the pizza down. <laughs> so XQuery. All right. So it's the XML query language. Okay, good. So it's this means of expressing queries with more power, with more expressiveness than, say, you could with XPath 1. Uh, it has these so-called flower expressions, which was the acronym which just denoted that you can have a for expression, a let expression, and so forth uh, embedded in these things. And there's much more logical control possible within an X query uh, expression than, say, we've seen in XPath. We spent a lot of our time, though, last week on DTD. Uh, DTD standing for Document Type Definition. Oddly enough, it's the only language, so to speak, we're looking at in this course that isn't itself written in XML, even though it's in the XML 1.0 spec. What's the purpose of DTD? Describe what an XML document should look like. Good. So it's just a, a language with which to express what an XML document should look like. This is useful for a few different reasons, potentially. One, you can use it to quote unquote validate a document, which is to say if you turn on validation using whatever XML parser you're using, like Xerxes, you can tell Xerxes by setting a bit, make sure this document is valid before my SACS event handlers start getting invoked, before you hand me back a DOM. Because if it's not valid, I want you to throw, say, a fatal parsing error and don't even let me touch this data because I might not know what to expect. Um, two, it might be useful for humans just to express in formal notation exactly what some document should look like. Of course, you could give someone some sample documents, and at the end of the day, that might be perfectly sufficient. But if you want to express precisely or set someone's expectations more precisely, you can express what you, your documents are going to look like using a DTD. So it's a DTD, for instance, that we included, I think, in um, Project 3, just to specify in, um, in more detail what Moreover's news feeds look like, so that at least there's a standard definition and the programmer isn't left to just infer exactly what kind of data to expect. So they're not perfect, though. Now what's, give me something bad, arguably, about DTD, or give me a weakness that would motivate wanting something more. Yeah, so well, and, and let me tweak that a little bit. There's not much in the way of data typing. So there are these, this notion, there is this notion of data types in DTD, but it's par fairly broad. You have the thing called an ID. You have a NM token, a name token. Uh, you have NM tokens, and you have a few different other ones, but they're not all that useful, right? One of the silly things about the ID type is that it can't, for instance, 
be a number, and yet that's what at least most programmers would use in any kind of relational database for an ID. Uh, and M token 2 is really just a string, say with no white space inside of it. Well, that's fine, but maybe it'd be nice to actually specify that this is actually a date time, or this is a floating point value, or this is a year, anything that has some inherent conceptual structure, but you really just can't express that with DTD. So you're rather limited with DTD as to the extent to which you can validate your document and the extent to which you can express your own ideas in writing. So XML schema, which we'll begin looking at today, is a much heavier handed solution to the same problem, the same opportunity to spec out what your data looks like, or equivalently to validate sample data or uh, instances of data uh, using a more precise definition. The downside, as you'll see though, is that it's there, say, too damn expressive. It's too darn verbose. Uh, in the number of characters, frankly, that you need to type or generate just to get the job done. So I'll mention as an aside, if you like the idea of XML schema and aren't so tied necessarily to official standards, but really are more interested in getting useful work done, do take a look, for instance, at uh, an alternative called Relax NG, R-E-L-A-X space NG, uh, which is just a a uh, simpler version of the same idea. You can do many of the same things. Uh, there are tools for it out there that allow you to write relax NG, uh, NG documents, but it tries to get away of some of the the, the cruft, the unnes the certain syntax that just um, is more verbose than it might need to be. So, but the ideas are the same. So these ideas nonetheless translate even to those uh, other types of standards. Okay, so this last time is an example of, say, a bookstore uh, that contains uh, zero or more books. And we had up top there an example of what we called an internal subset. And that was just jargon for saying that the DTD is embedded inside of the document. So what is it about this DTD here that associates that DTD with the root element? In other words, how do you, spe or equivalently, how do you specify which document or which element the following DTD applies to? It's a bit of a leading question because you can infer it from there, but again, just to look back. Yeah, so that token right after doc type, where you specify here is the root element to which I want to apply or uh, use the following DTD. The square bracket is what denoted here comes an internal subset, so to speak. That is, just here comes the DTD rather than being in a, a separate file. And now we go ahead and define exactly what the various elements need to be. So the convention I've tried to take here is to make sure everything is sorted uh, conceptually top to bottom in the file, but there's no uh, there's no requirement that these things be sorted. White spaces are also pretty irrelevant. But in English, what is a bookstore defined as being, according to this line here? Perfect. So zero or more books. That is, its children are zero or more books, as suggested by that regular expression in that per parenthetical content model, just again to whip out the jargon we've been using. All right, this next one. What does this mean precisely, the fact that there's this comma separated list now of names? So, oh, good, I'm going to push a little harder. So the content of book, what do you mean by the content of book? These are the elements that, are, that make up a book element. Okay, be even more precise. These are the elements that make up a book. What do you mean? That must make up a book. Uh, what do you mean make up a book? Oh, these, these elements appear in this order. Um, good, okay. In, in that order, I'll take your in that order and children as children of books. So that's exactly what it means. And I'm not uh, semantics are generally uninteresting, but at least being precise about some of the definitions can be useful. So pardon my pushing. Good, even more precise. So the fact that there's no regular expressions, uh, there's no uh, regular expression syntax going on there, like star or question mark, means a book has to have as its first child a title, its second child an author, its third title a date. ISBN followed by publisher in precisely that order. Um, finally, we're kind of punting with a title, but what does it mean a title can be? Yeah, just parsed character data. So there can be entities in there that get parsed, as is the nature of PC data. Uh, but other than that, we're not really specifying. And this, of course, is not an exhaustive list because we're clearly missing definitions for author and date and ISBN and so forth, but you can imagine them all just being PC data. And that's where it sort of has the right idea. It's a great first step, but then very quickly it feels that we're waving our hand and saying, eh, just whatever is fine. And it's not 
it's a nice solution, especially when there's so much syntax set up to implement these goals of um, specking out your data and validating your data. Yeah. Good question. So if an XML document has a DTD in it as an internal subset, so to speak, does that mean it's got to be applied? No. It just means it's there, but the parser has to actually use it. And to use it, you would need to turn on validation in your parser, either by clicking a button in a GUI, or in the case of our JAXP code, using the set validating flag to true on the parser's factory. Yep. Mm -hmm. How would, uh, or can DTD deal with namespaces? Oh, excellent question. Um, how can DTD deal with namespaces? Not really. Not really at all. So, and that is one of the bigger nails in the coffin, especially given that since the advent of XML, there have been all these XML derivatives, all of, most of which rely on namespacing to distinguish themselves since they tend to be intermingled in documents. That's a big problem, long story short. So fortunately, we have today an alternative. It's definitely much more expressive, but it pretty much tackles any and all of the potential issues we've run into, perhaps to a fault in that it does, as you'll see, um, require more verboseness, but the nice thing is, certainly pedagogically, it's also all very self-explanatory. As you'll see from a number of the examples, it's not really necessary to look up what any of these elements mean, because for the most part, they're so expressive as to just convey meaning just through the syntax itself. So let's take a look. Um, I won't dwell on some of the history, because for the curious, you can certainly glance at this uh, in the future, but know that um, there are a whole bunch of different proposals. There's somewhat of an interesting history behind XML schema um, brought to the table by a whole bunch of companies. And ultimately, it's out of conversations and out of a W3C working group that we have what we now know as XML schema. And you'll see commonalities in XML schema vis-a-vis, -vis, where else have we seen this? XQuery, for instance, borrows the data typing model. Uh, we saw similar sharing of syntax from other languages, even in SVG, with respect to Xlink. So now we're at the point of the course where you'll start to see a lot more cooperation in terms of specs among these various standards, which is nice because it means you don't have to relearn things or uh, re-look things up. Um, the funny thing, if uh, you take pleasure in these things, <coughs> is that it's really darn long, the recommendation for schema. There's actually three different documents which collectively spec out schema, which makes it, of the things we've looked at thus far, among the tougher ones to wrap your mind around by just reading the spec. And so that's why we've actually divided some of the material into this week and next week's lectures, um, <laughs> but certainly some of the online references, like the W3C schools, uh, is a great place to start. Um, less so, I think, these recommendations, unless you're looking for something very precise. But let's begin by way of example. And what I did here was whip up uh, PO.XML and PO.XSD, both of which you should have in tonight's printouts, all of which uh, are alphabetized, so it's roughly middle of your packet. I'm going to go ahead and open PO.XML. And actually, I don't think I whipped this up. I think I borrowed this from whatever source might be cited in comments somewhere or lost over the years and hit historically. But let's take a look at a few interesting things here. So one, this is just an XML document, first of all. So it's clearly an XML document for some kind of purchase order. I'm going to ignore these attributes for a moment and just lo note, looks like there's a ship to element here. So this thing's being shipped to Alice Smith at such and such an address. It's going to be billed to Robert Smith. There's some kind of comment here. There's an item with a part number. It looks like they bought a lawnmower and a baby monitor. Okay, so eh, fluffy, uninteresting details, but useful in that we now have at least a representative structure that we can begin to spec out in terms of XML schema, because there's a lot of interesting opportunities here. Ship date, for instance, seems to have some standard of year, month, date. It'd be nice if we could express YYY-MM-DD, and we'll see that we can. Price certainly has some structure to it beyond just being PC data. Quantity certainly is probably integral. Uh, product name, maybe we can be a little hand wavy there and just say PC data or the like. We'll come back to that. Part number presumably is standardized. So in short, there's a lot of interesting opportunities now for actually validating this data. Or if you're trying to write a program that processes this data or validates this data, we have some interesting opportunities to spec it out in a um, very formal sense. So 
Let's take a look first now at what's going on up here. So order date is apparently just an attribute germane to this notion of a purchase order. But now we've got two interesting attributes. So notice that this line here, and actually let me push this onto the audience, just the blinking line, XMLNS colon XSI. Translate that if you could into English. What is that line doing technically for us? Even without knowing anything about schema. Good. So or it's, uh, it's declaring a namespace and associating with that namespace a prefix, XSI, uh, XML schema instance is the convention. But again, it could be foo, bar, or baz. It's just a convention that we're using here. And now, take a guess. What is this final attribute doing? No, and here already you see an instance of verboseness. No namespace schema location is the name of the attribute. Exactly. That's the file that contains the schema against which this document, if validation is turned on, should be validated. So very similar in spirit to what we already could do in DTD, but with different syntax. In fact, this is clearly XML written syntax. So because we've associated XSI, the prefix, with this namespace, assuming we parse this XML document with a, names, uh, with a schema aware parser, like Xerxes, that is something that understands XML schema because someone bothered to implement support for it, what this attribute in that namespace is designed to do is to tell the parser where to look for the spec for this XML document. So let's take a look. So in po.xsd, mm -hmm. Why is it no namespace schema location? So notice that all of the elements in this document are in what namespace? The default namespace, just quote unquote, the no namespace namespace. So what that means is that any element that's in the default namespace should be validated using that document. That rather, yeah, that document, that XSD file. Is there a way to specify Absolutely. Yes, so we'll see that in a moment. There is a way to express uh, DTDI, a schema per namespace. So we could break this just to be more clear. If I, for whatever reason, decided, you know what, I want all of these elements to be in the XMLNS equals foo namespace, now I just broke everything because now everything is in a namespace and yet I'm trying to validate the default namespace using that document. So just to make more clear that point. All right, so let's look at PO.XSD, our first example of a schema. So at the top here, we've got the XML declaration, which is typically optional. And now we have the root element. So this convention of XSD is just that, a convention. XS colon is also pretty common to see as well. But again, you could call it foo. Uh, schema is obviously the root element for any XML schema document. This is just associating the prefix XSD with schema's namespace. So this is one of these things you just got to memorize or look up or hard code every time, much like we did for SVG and XSLT and the like, because that is what the W3C decided means schema's namespace. So an annotation, this is a comment in a sense you might expect. It's a way of annotating the schema with some, in, with some potentially useful information, but not in the comment sense which, recall, doesn't get passed to the application necessarily because it's just a, a raw comment. So an annotation will, in fact. And now let's take a look. So I'm just going to scroll quickly through this. So that specs out collectively PO.XML. So let's take a look. What was the root element of PO.XML? Purchase order. OK, so lowercase purchase, capital order. So here we have, and again, in no particular order, that you don't have to do it top to bottom, but this file has. Notice that we already clearly have the notion of data typing. So I'm not going to say right away what a purchase order element looks like, but rather I'm going to define it as being of type purchase order type. Okay, so presumably elsewhere in this document is a spec for what a purchase order type is. And in fact, just a few lines down, notice this new syntax. So in XML schema, as we'll see, there's this notion of uh, complex types and simple types and a whole bunch of confusing jargon, at least on first glance, but ultimately, which uh, is, is, um, is quite 
uh, is ultimately not all that bad to wrap one's mind around. So let's just take a look by inferring what this stuff is doing, and then we'll, we'll tease apart what all these various lines mean. So here is a complex type, whatever that means, the name of which is purchase order type. So herein lies our spec for what a purchase order is. And let me push on the audience, what do you think it is, based just on intuition here? What does it mean if an element is of type purchase order type, apparently? It's a valid purchase order element, but more specifically, what comprises a purchase order element exactly? Perfect. So a purchase order element is has four children, named exactly as you noted, <laughs> ship to, build to, common items. <laughs> Um, and that's a bit of a white lie because notice that, and you can infer this, that a comment element can apparently be effectively what? Yeah, uh, optional. So here we have this notion of a question mark because it turns out that if you don't specify this attribute called min occurs, well, by default, implicitly, it's one. And if you don't specify max occurs, M-A-X capital occurs, explicitly it too defaults to one. So the implication is that ship to must be the first child of a purchase order element. Bill to must be the second child. Comment may or may not be there, but if it is there, you can only have one such comment because this so-called max occurs attribute, which is not explicitly there, is implicitly one. And then the last child, whether it's number three or number four, is an items element. And I'm uh, emphasizing that they, they must be in this order because of this syntax here. A sequence means in the following order, but we'll see there's a way of expressing that they all be here, but in any order. And that will be one advantage over DTD already. So notice now that we seem to be relying on some built-in data types, as I think I alluded to back in SVG when we looked at some of the uh, SVG, or not SVG, uh, maybe X query, when we looked at some of the data types. So a comment is just a string in, say, the Java sense. It's just a string of text, PC data, effectively. All right, well, what else is going on here? Well, what about, uh, yeah? What is that? Ah, sure. So we'll, we'll again likely come back to this. But in the interest of reusing code, rather than declare an element like this all at once, you can actually say, you know what? Put a, a, assume that a comment element will be here, but I've defined it elsewhere. So this is defining an element called ship to. This is defining an element called bill to. This is referring to an element called comment that's defined more precisely elsewhere, whereas these are defined right here. So notice, in fact, what attribute is glaringly missing now from this third line? The type, right? So this isn't a definition. It's a reference in, um, in that conceptual sense. So what is it referring to? Well, it's referring to an element of name comment whose type, it turns out, is string. Now, I could have just copied and pasted this and put it here instead. But if there's elsewhere in the document that I want to use a comment, I, wouldn't, I would have to copy paste this code. And this is just one baby step toward reusing code and factoring out something that right, might reasonably be elsewhere, as we may see. Yeah? One sure. Define the XSD namespace up at the top. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if you so chose, we could have ditched the prefix altogether and then thereby gotten rid of all of these XSD colons. Um, it's, it's largely a stylistic decision, assuming you don't have any kinds of collisions with uh, other elements that you're using in this document or some other. I would say that the convention, though, is to generally prefix things, just to be more clear, but stylistic more than anything else. All right, so notice now we've got a kind of recurse conceptually because we don't yet know what a US address is and we don't yet know what an items is, but we do seem to have one last thing on a purchase order. So recall that PO.XML looked like this, and even though two of these attributes had to do just with the schema stuff, the first was just a raw attribute, so to speak, that called order date. Well, what is that thing? Well, it turns out that schema standardizes what we mean by date. So notice here that, excuse me, the very last line of this purchase order type entity is an attribute element that's saying, you know what, this any element of purchase order type has an attribute called order date whose type is XSD date. 
the format for which you can look online for the, per, the precise spec, but in long story short, it's YYYY-MM-DD, as you might expect. So it standardizes things nicely. Well, what's one of these US addresses? Well, this is nice for a couple of reasons. So one, notice that both ship2 and bill2 were of the same type. Be nice to be able to reuse code. And in fact, the fact that we're specifying that the type is US address means we can factor this thing out and just define it once rather than for each of these things. So in English, what is a US address, apparently? Yeah, but, and it's a, specifically, um, it's children are name, city, uh, name, street, city, state, zip. In that order, and how many times can each of these children appear? Once. once and only once must they, in fact, appear. So finally, we're doing something a little more interesting than string. We seem to have defined zip code as a decimal. Not perfect, because a decimal number is just some number containing zeros through nines. But at least it's slightly more rigorous than just saying string. But we'll see that through pattern definitions, can we be even more precise? Because at least in this country, a zip code is either five numbers or five numbers dash four more numbers. And we can express that. Does decimal include a decimal point? Uh, decimal, no. So it's decimal in the base sense. And I believe, actually, that's a good question. Decimal, decimal, decimal. Let me double check that. Um, can, can you distinguish you can. You can. And I'm just wondering, because I think we excerpted this example from somewhere, maybe the spec or somewhere. But uh, let me double check if it, I don't think it allows floating points, because in that case, we would have just said float. But I'll double check if we have time at the break. I'll pull up the spec. Uh, let's just take a look here. Oh. Country is an attribute. So we'll use this as a discussion point in a moment, too. This is apparently of type NM token, which is actually borrowed from DTD. We saw that type before, which effectively just means a single word containing numbers and or letters. Um, and I think the underscore character is possible. And why is it an NM token? Well, um, we know that, oh, and here we have this ability, much like we did for DTD, to specify that this attribute must be fixed at a certain value. And because I know I want to fix it at US, I can define that just as an NM token. It doesn't really matter what I define it as, because I'm specifying it's got to be that anyway. But we have to give it a type, and that one works. We could have said string as well. So here's a question, though. It seems to be the case that country is an attribute as opposed to a child, child element. Good, bad, why? Yeah, probably not. At least it's not obvious to me how or why you'd want to conceptually extend the definition of a country beyond just its name. Maybe you would, but clearly the authors of this document figured that the buck sort of stops with the name of the country, and there's no reason to try to tease apart a country in terms of more metadata. But we could have put it as an element, but with this definition, it's certainly not allowed given this spec. Well, what's in items? Okay, so a little bigger here, and we'll come back to this kind of complexity in a bit. Consider this a teaser. Notice that an items element, and just to put this in context, recall that the document looked like this. After the bill to and ship to, we had a list of item elements, which were the items these folks bought, presumably. So notice that it's a sequence of the following. An element called item that may or may not be there, because its uh, lower bound is 0 and its upper bound is unbounded, again, in the spirit of verboseness. Uh, there's no way of expressing the infinity sign, shall we say. Notice that this element, in turn, is of complex type. So notice that I'm inlining here the, de the type of this element rather than saying a item element is of type equals, quote unquote, some data type. That is, I know I'm not going to reuse this data type, and so it's fine to just conceptually inline it here, because there's no reason to uh, refer to this in any other context. You could, but notice just the conceptual difference between inlining the type's definition like this, as opposed to what we did for uh, the thing called US address a moment ago, which was a data type unto itself. So what is an item element? Well, it looks like it's a sequence of product name, followed by quantity, and here's some neat tricks, and we'll come back to this. Quantity, as a child element, is just a simple type, which we'll clarify later. 
that is restricted to be a positive integer, but the maximum possible value is 99. So for whatever reason, the folks who designed this PO spec, this product order spec, mandate that you can't buy more than 99 items at a time. Okay, why? Who cares? But this is how we might express that. And again here, as you might guess, not only is there a max exclusive element, guess what else there is? Max inclusive element. All right, so they spared no expense in offering you uh, different ways of solving the same problems. Now, after that element called quantity, notice that all the nesting goes away down here. Now, a US price is of type decimal. Uh, so what I think is the case, actually, inferring from this example, I don't know why zip was defined as a decimal, because I think that means your zip code could be 123.45, which is nonsensical. Um, but it is uh, reasonable that a price should allow for a decimal point. But again, I'll look up the difference between it and float. A comment, notice here, I'm referring back to the comment element we used earlier. So I could have, um, so that's allowing me to reuse that code. Now I have a ship date, which is just of type XSD date, but it's apparently optional. And then finally, it looks like a part number attribute is required. So here's another feature of schema, use equals required, whereas before that might not be the case for an attribute. Type equals quote unquote SKU. So what's a SKU? Well, here's a neat feature. And again, we'll come back to these kinds of details. Notice that a SKU is a string but it's restricted to be yes of this, of this type at the end of the day, but restricted such that it must match this pattern. And then any of you familiar with regular expressions know that this means three uh, digits followed by a hyphen, followed by the letter A through Z twice. Or follow, A through Z followed by A through Z. Any one of those letters back to back. So that's pretty cool. Already we have more expressiveness, and I'll argue, even though this is a bit long, and even though some of the syntax certainly probably looks new, um, it kind of explains itself. And so it's a nice language for just bootstrapping yourself by way of examples. But let's try to tease apart some of this stuff. Uh, so why are we doing this in the first place? Well, this, these are just, um, consider this an enumeration of some of the ideas that we've talked about before. Perhaps worth noting are things we did touch upon last week, which is that you can augment an instance, that is an XML document, with some default values. And that can simplify your life because you can trust that certain types of values or specific values will be in the document. Um, and this is a useful one too in terms of uniqueness. If you do validate according to IDs and whatnot, you can just make sure that if what this purchase, what this XML document is representing is some kind of database dump, and you just want to blindly import it into your own database, well, at least using these techniques, can you make sure, without checking one by one, that all of the IDs that you yourself might be using as primary keys are unique? And that can be a useful thing, too. You can certainly do this other ways, but again, this is giving you this option. So what about this thing here? Well, this is another example, this time for just a product. And let's see if we can't tease this thing apart. So it looks like a product now. And notice that I'm um, again declaring this prefix up here, XSD. Notice that a product is of type product type. Well, what's a product type in English? Mm -hmm. So it has a child element called number. And then one called size. In that order, each occurring exactly one time by requirement. The first is of type integer, pretty straightforward, positive or negative, to be clear, uh, or zero. And then size type is defined down here. It doesn't have to be, but it is apparently. So a size type in English is what? Perfect. It's an int between 2 and 18 inclusive. So here's a little snippet. Does this pat, would this validate according to this schema? Yep, it seems to match effective date, seems to match the pattern we promised earlier. Uh, number seems to pass the test as well because it just has to be an integer. And size is certainly between 2 and 18 inclusive. All right, so let's tease apart some of the jargon, not because the words themselves are interesting, but because you may very well see them if certainly looking things up or trying to uh, pick up some other uh, exposure to this as well. So as is the case in, program, in some programming languages, 
um, a declaration uh, is what you would describe. You would say to, you would say that I'm declaring an element or I'm declaring an attribute to be of a certain type. But when you say def definition, I'm defining something. You define a data type or you define a group. So you declare elements and attributes. You define their types. At the end of the day, it's largely just semantics, but uh, perhaps as uh, grad students in computer science, these are useful things to know. But the order in the XML schema of any of these things, declarations or definitions, and that's the more interesting takeaway, completely irrelevant. So unlike something like C, where all your variables and types need to be defined first before you use them, not the case with schema. The processor will read the whole thing first and then figure out what you mean, assuming it's defined somewhere. So there is this notion of scoping in schema. So something that's a global component just means that it's a child of the schema root element itself. And that just means if you define a data type at that level in the document, you can use it throughout. And we've seen a couple different examples of data types that were defined locally in inline fashion, as I called it, versus globally, where we give it a name, we put it at the, uh, at the root of the document, uh, or just in the um, as a child of the root element. And then we can reuse that data type like US address anywhere. So there is this notion of scope. All right. Uh, attributes and elements declarations. I uh, don't want to rehash too much of what we already discussed, but uh, eh, this pretty much just reiterates what we have looked at already. So I'll leave it up there as just a more precise definition of that. But now we get to the juicy stuff. So all this notion of complexity and simplicity boils down to some potentially confusing jargon, at least on first glance. So what is this all about? So know now that if you ha are an element with a simple type, you have character data content, but no child, no children or attributes. So to be clear, if you are of simple type, you have no children and you have no attributes. If you are of complex type, you can have child, uh, children or attributes. Okay? So that's at least a fairly straightforward definition. And unfortunately, the third bullet spoils it. What uh, obviously then are attributes, simple or complex? That's right, simple. Because okay? they can't have children, and they obviously can't have attributes themselves. So that's worth noting, only because we can reuse these same constructs when defining the types of attributes as well. Um, what I called inline before, you can also call it anonymous types, and that's the more formal definition for it. An anonymous type is just one that doesn't have a name. You can't reuse it. It's scoped only in the context in which you defined it. Here's an example. This notion of size might be defined as a simple type that at the end of the day is an integer, but it's restricted to be an int between 2 and 18 inclusive. So notice that we, what we did here. We took an element, gave it the name size, and then we said it's a simple type. It can't have children. It can't have attributes. In fact, it's so simple, it's just a primitive. A primitive in the Java or C++ sense. Specifically, it's the integer or int primitive. But I want to go one step further and restrict this thing to be within a range of values. It's still a simple type, because we've not augmented it with children or attributes but we can restrict. So this is an instance of a simple type there. So what is neat, even if you don't need it, say, the first time you employ this, you can have this notion of hierarchy and inheritance in schema. So much like you can define classes in other languages and have subclasses and sub-subclasses, you can have subtypes and sub-subtypes, all of which inherit from each other for various different reasons, one of the biggest of which is just reusability of code. You can factor out common things. Uh, you can do a bit of introspection in a sense that you can figure out the type of an element potentially in this way. Um, but at the end of the day, it allows you to make refinements to existing data types. So in, uh, in essence, we are inheriting, in this case here, from the integral type. And we're saying, you know what, it's an integer, but it is, actually, is this fair to say? Yep, it's an integer, but it's a more narrow definition of an integer. And that's certainly possible. Whereas in turn, an integer conceptually is just PC data. So you have PC data up here, an integer is making it more specific, and then this restriction is making it more uh, specific still. So there's already this notion of hierarchy, and you can formalize this with things like addresses. For instance, if I wanted to have some base notion of an address, most any address probably has a person's name and a street. 
uh, and probably a city and probably a country, but after that maybe it's a county in some places, maybe it's a state in other places, maybe it's a province in other places. So maybe there's some context-specific fields, so I might want to have descending from a more generic address type a UK address type or a Japanese address type or a US address type, and we can do that with schema. So what are all of the simple types? That is the so-called primitives that are available. Well, I think I copied this slide from X, uh, our X query talk. There's like 40 some odd primitive types that you can rely on. Fortunately, if you can think of a name for it, it probably is on this list. So positive integer, negative integer, non-negative integer, non-positive integer. You got a lot of options here. Um, actually, did I just mention one that's not? Well, I, didn't, I said non-negative integer, which does not exist. All right, so take that with a grain of salt. So there are, though, various types, both signed and unsigned. Um, it depends on your needs, certainly, which of these you employ. And I have arbitrarily categorized them as string-related, date-related ones, number-related ones, and then I couldn't really put those into any bucket, so just left them alone. For more precise definitions of these, I believe the W3Schools online reference has more specific examples, for instance, of what we mean by a G day or a G month or a G month day, which give you pieces of what we call just a date earlier. Oh, and incidentally, I'll no note it, even though it's a little sloppy, know that like with DTD, you can have list types and also union types. So space separated values, each of which is of a specified type, or union types, which can be either this type or this type but we won't dwell on that since they are more corner cases perhaps than anything. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay, let me just take a peek. Why don't we go ahead and take our five minute break here and we'll resume with a bit on complexity. All right, we are back. An excellent question just came up. We happen to have the answer on the screen, which is with DTD and or schema, can you cut corners, if you will, and just validate part of the document and not worry about validating some of the elements? In short, with DTD, you cannot, you can say, put PC data here. It's mixed character content, mixed data, uh, mixed uh, element content, as we saw last week. But with schema, can you actually use this item, this element here called XSD any, which as you might uh, suspect, just means anything can go here. But now let's go back to some of these basics. How many things can go there? Uh, not, not types, but how many elements can go where this placeholder is, do you think? Uh, not quite, not zero or more. One and only one, because of that min occurs, max occurs. So one of the neat things about schema too, and I think the W3Schools website makes this pretty clear, is that on many of these elements are there some default implicit attributes, like min occurs, max occurs, which do have default values, which allows you with less verboseness to just say something like this, but imply that something can go here. Um, and I believe the default values for XSD any, though I'll, I should double check that, are one and one for both min and max. But if you changed max occurs to unbounded, that would really let you punt and say anything else can go here so long as this other stuff is also there, which we'll look at in just a moment. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Good. So what is a product type? So this is just another example here. Uh, in English, what, and we have some new syntax, so I'll leave it to you to decide, what is a product type in English? Its children are what? A number? Okay, but that's an int, followed by? Perfect, so either a size or color. Finish my sentence, though. Up to three of those. So think of XSD choice as you can kind of infer, I would argue, from the syntax as inducing a sort of loop whereby you get to make up to three passes through this loop, each time plucking out either a size or a color. So what this allows you to do is, one, have multiple instances of some element, but also an assortment of different elements. Now, whether or not this makes sense conceptually is sort of besides the point for us in this class today, because why would you have three sizes or two sizes and one color or three colors? And 
that's really not so much the point here, but rather just to emphasize that you can do this. And it certainly can be useful in other contexts where you want to have some foo, some bar, some bases, but only three of them maximally for whatever conceptual or architectural reason. Well, what are these things? One is of type size type, one is of type color type. Presumably those are defined somewhere. But the lesson we had a moment ago was that following a number followed by zero or more of these things can be anything else. So you can at least trust that if the product type element uh, is present in your document, it's going to have at least a child called number. It might have three more children called size and or color. But then lastly, it might have some other element altogether of any name of any type, as suggested there. But this thing does have an attribute called effective date, f date, uh, that's of type date. So the new nuances here now are choice and any. But what about now namespaces? Let's formalize this. And what, just to give you the arc here for the next few minutes, the goal is to um, ultimately answer the question, how do we use this? How do we actually use these besides just specifying excuse me, that some XSD file belongs with some XML file. How do we do this in code? And then we'll also take a look at project four. Uh, even though you still have project, project three in your hands, project four will have you look more at some schema stuff, but it will also build upon uh, the skills and the, uh, the material that project three had. So we'll still be server side. So namespaces. Um, Actually, this slide was meant to be just a quick refresher on namespaces, but we seem to bring this up in conversation quite a bit. So I'll just leave it at that and just remind you, perhaps, that uh, namespaces really allow you to distinguish elements in different conceptual um, scopes, perhaps. Uh, you might, can now have a foo element in one namespace, another foo element in another that might have completely different meaning, but now with a names, thanks to namespaces can you distinguish the two and you can validate the two differently. So how do you go about integrating multiple namespaces into a document? Um, not so much in the XS XSLT meets SVG meets XHTML sense, but just in a plain old XML document. Well, here's an example. Here's an order a document. It looks like we're defining two prefixes, ORD and product, each of which maps to these two namespaces decided by someone arbitrarily. Well, what is an order? It, it, or what does this order contain? It has a number child, which looks like this, followed by an items child, followed by, it looks like one product, but that's in a different namespace. So who cares? Why might this be useful? Well. And when you start to integrate data from multiple sources, it might very well be reasonable, for instance, that Amazon's purchase orders contains a lot of Amazon-specific information. But then, because of all their third-party arrangements, their purchase orders some kind, sometimes contain metadata uh, for items sold by someone else. And they don't want to have to worry about or care how those third-party vendors spec out their data. What does it mean to be a product? What does it mean to be a product number? Because those folks might have their own naming scheme and their own numbering schemes for their products. So simply by using a different namespace for those children, in this case product, can you distinguish the owners of, say, the data or the data types um, and allow them to be validated separately using, say, even two different XSD documents. So notice in particular, too, as I suggested with Foo earlier, that this number element is actually in this document twice, but in different contexts, that is namespaces the advantage of which is that it can be validated according to each namespace rather than by some universal definition of what a number is. Well, a word on this default namespace, just to be clear. So we can do the same idea, but get rid of one of the prefixes. Because at the end of the day, we only need prefixes if we're trying to mix multiple namespaces, or for clarity's sake, which is more of a stylistic call. In this case, which prefix have I obviously gotten rid of? ORD. But functionally, this document, or um, in terms of content, this document is equivalent. We've just gotten rid of that prefix by arbitrarily deciding that the default namespace is going to be ORD. All right, so now on schemas and how they relate to namespaces. Well, back to um, uh, the association of schemas with XML documents. So in the first, very first example, we had an XML document very proactively saying, for any uh, no namespace schema location is po.xsd. That is, for any elements in me in the default namespace, use this schema. Well, you can take a more proactive approach from the schema document. And at the top of a schema, say that this document is meant to validate elements in the whatever namespace. Well, what namespace? In this case, this schema 
is targeting this namespace. Which is to say, if a smart processor was fed both some XML file as input and this schema document as input, and it just so happened that the XML document's nodes, by way of prefixes or the default namespace specification, were in the example.org slash prod namespace, that processor would use this schema to validate this document, just because this one targets that namespace and this one is in that namespace. So this is now the, using the schema to specify who should validate him, va rather than the XML document specify who should validate him. So what does this thing look like? Well, pretty similar to what we saw before, and I won't dwell on the details because syntactically there's nothing new here, but what is interesting is that we're now able to specify in the schema itself what the, uh, what the destination is or what the purpose of this thing is. Who does, should it get applied to? So how do you do it concretely now? So we have these building blocks. We can put the hints in the XML document. We can put the hints in the schema document. How do you now make it all work? So you can take this approach, as we said a moment ago, so that you at least make the association. You can let the application choose. For instance, um, a browser um, might is a browser these days. If it's trying to val if it's trying to parse an XHTML document and it sees that doc type declaration at the top, it should know if the browser is XHTML compliant what it means to validate that document or at least parse that document. So the application itself might just know how to validate the document. Now IE is not really in the habit of raising a red flag when a document's not valid, but in theory underneath the hood it knows something about the structure of the document because someone programmed it to know what XHTML is. So the application in effect can choose. Well let the user choose. So if you play with XML Spy or Stylus, which are also useful tools for just experimenting with this stuff because of auto completion and the like, well, you can just specify with a little GUI what should validate what. Um, or you can have your processor dereference the namespace URI to locate a schema. So that's not so much using a hint. Um, actually, the namespace URI. So this actually is a rare case where you can actually interpret the namespace URI string as a URI and go fetch it, say, from the internet. But I won't dwell on that one because we've emphasized that namespace strings really are just unique and the fact that they look like URIs is really just a convenience, not an implication that there's anything at that URI or at that URL. So let's do this with an example. Here is, albeit on a slide form, then we'll do it in code. So here up here, oh, so up here is a product uh, root element and it looks like it is going to be using what file to validate it? Well, this is weird syntax, but know that you can do this by way of these hints. This specifies that the schema location for anything in this namespace is in a local file called prod.xsd. And I say it's I think it's sloppy just because you're sort of arbitrarily now using attributes as space separated values just to convey two pieces of data, but such is the way it is. This case here, Notice that we can specify multiple schemas explicitly in the schema docu or in the XML document that we should use prod.xsd for anything in this namespace and org.xsd for anything in this namespace. Which of these are actually relevant here? Well, it turns out both are, but give me an example if you could of an element in this document that's going to be validated with org.xsd's contents. The, the f number here? OK, what else? Items. Items. And now let me take a step back. Why are you rattling these off? Why are these two elements going to get validated with the contents of prod.xsd? Or sorry, what did I say? Ord.xsd. Yeah, so the default namespace is inherited. So this applies not only to the add element, but also to this element because it's a child, this element because it's a child, this element, whoa, wait a minute, it's getting overridden by this default namespace, which means that this element, this element, and this element are going to be validated not by org.xsd, but by prod.xsd. So this is actually um, a uh, mental cue, for me at least, to make mention of something we've seen in several submissions, um, and it's not uncommon, whereby if you are getting such weird output in your XSLT or SVG or XSLT or XHTML, that's things like this, XML, NS, 
Okay, so you got to get rid of that. So there's no reason for it to be there. And I say you should get rid of that because it does tend to confuse some processors. Mahesh and I were talking to a student online just the other day about why their SVG was not displaying correctly. And it quite simply was because there were errant instances of these in their SVG, which was confusing the SVG processor because it was suggesting that things are in an uh, empty string namespace as opposed to the SVG namespace. The reason this tends to happen is because, at least in XSLT, if you think through your code carefully, these default namespaces are inherited, but they're scoped locally. So uh, this is maybe not as useful in the abstract, but maybe it'll trigger a thought if you ever encounter it yourself. Recall that in XSLT, many of you tend to use multiple templates, quite reasonable. But each of those templates has their own scope, and they might be in different names. The elements they output might be in different namespaces. So long story short, if you're seeing things like this in your output, actually take advantage of it as a thought exercise as to how to get rid of that, because the issue will likely boil down to something similar in spirit to this, where you have different namespaces going on, either because you have different templates, one of which is explicitly mentioning a namespace, and one of which is not, or you're overriding something, not necessarily realizing it. But again, I should probably have to leave that vague without a concrete example at hand. Yeah. So, just to clear it up, mm -hmm. we have two namespaces here. One is the default one, and one is the XSI one. Is that right? Mm. Correct. Yes, two namespaces. And then XSI is validated by two different schemas, prod and R. Uh, not quite. So, just to repeat for the camera, the XSI namespace <coughs> is only used here. Um, is so the XSI namespace prefix, XSI, is only introduced so that we can then include this attribute which exists in that namespace. So the reason we need this line before this line is because if this whole document is going to be parsed by a program that understands schema and validation using it, the attribute that you use to associate a schema with an XML document is schema location. But that's defined in the schema spec. So to access elements in, or attributes in the schema spec, you have to access them by way of the namespace. And to do that, you need this layer of indirection by first defining a prefix, even if you just use it once, and then specify that you want to use this attribute in that namespace. These things, however, aren't relevant at all to the XSI prefix namespace per se. They apply only to the document in question. So in other words, this is saying, because schema location tells the par parser the following, that anything in this namespace in this document should validate against this. And anything in this namespace should validate against this. And the reason this works is because a schema parser processor knows how to parse this and then interpret this. If that makes sense. So, ordinarily, could I have defined two different namespaces altogether, one for prod and XSD, and one for or and prefix my elements? Yes, absolutely. Another, dare say, more clear approach to the same problem would be not to use these default namespaces, but rather in the root element, define XMLNS colon ord and then put this URL, and then another one, xmlns colon prod, and then use this URL, and then don't get lazy and just write the names of these elements, but rather prefix every one of these elements with the appropriate prefix, then that would make it more explicit to the reader, um, though not to the computer, what belongs in what namespace. But the effect is the same here, and it's perhaps a little cleaner in this way because there's less distraction. There's just few four fewer characters on every line as a result, or uh, even more than that. OK, so what can you use to validate? Uh, so XSV is something that's online if you want to play around when any of the examples today or experimenting with the stuff this week or next. Xerxes, we'll see in a moment. You just turn on the feature similar to what we did last week with our SAX validator. Style is Studio, XML Spy, pretty much means just click a button. If it's not obvious which button to click, just pull up their help sections and type in validate, and it'll tell you what button or menu option to choose. And then other programs behave in different ways. Other APIs behave in different ways, and it's a, 
uh, read the manual kind of thing just to figure out how you turn on schema validation. So let's go ahead and do exactly that with a Xerxes example here. I'm going to go ahead and open up a file called Sax Validator 2. So notice that I get away with writing relatively little code because I can just extend a default handler. And down here, uh, looks like I'm just checking for use it, proper usage, I'm just arbitrarily defined, so I'd have a little demo program. I'm going to grab argv of zero for the name of the file I want to validate. Now notice here, uh, validator. So this program, as the usage implies, allows me to specify if I want to validate at all, and if so, with DTD or XSD. So effectively what I did was I took last week's example called Sax Validator, copied that code, called it Sax Validator 2, and then just added a couple conditions plus this optional uh, support for DTD or schema. So now that you have an all-in-one solution so that I can optionally validate with DTD or schema. Well, what do I do in each case? Well, I'm going to try to do the following. First, I'm going to instantiate my parser, or rather my factory, by way of this line. And we've seen that many times now uh, for several different examples. And now I'm going to do this. So if validator is not null, that is argv of 1 contained a string, presumably DTD or XSD, and that string equals DTD, this, these three lines of code are identical to last week, or at least the first two are, and now I'm just printing out saying what I just turned on. So these two lines of code we saw last week. Set the flag on the factory, uh, churn out the, fac uh, the parser, and you're done. That will now validate things that's passed. The different code this week is that if you want to validate using Xerxes, or more generally, JAXP, no matter what the underlying parser is, and I want to do so using schema, notice that the lines of code you use, a little more annoying, but just as easily copy-pasted, is you need to turn on namespace awareness. This, the whole, this whole process works by way of namespaces. You again turn on set validating, just like before. Now I go ahead and instantiate my parser, and now, for better or for worse, I need to set a couple of properties. So the properties I want to specify are one called schema language. And think of this as just a key, an annoyingly long key. And this as the value, a somewhat annoyingly long value. So what this is saying to the parser is set the schema language to be XML schema. So the complexity here is simply meant to allow the parser to use different types of uh, schema languages uh, to set different properties. Frankly, this is what you can do or should do if you want to validate in this context using uh, schema. So uh, this you can find, too, in um, either the JAXP doc, Java doc or uh, certainly in the Xerxes documentation. Apache's got some nice code. Otherwise, if you didn't type DTD or XSD, forget it. Let's not validate at all. We're just going to parse it with a SACS parser like we did in week two of the course. Now I've got these error handling routines implementing the error handler just so that I see something if validation fails. So I'm going to go ahead and run uh, Java C on this file. Now I've got my byte codes. Let's go ahead and validate po.xml. Recall that this file looks like this. Okay, it's making the association with this hint on its fourth line here with po.xsd. I'm going to run Java of Sax Validator on po.xml. And what should I see? Okay, nothing much at all. Validation's off, but looks like it at least is well formed. Otherwise, I would have gotten a parsing error. Now let's try DTD. All right, so that didn't work. And the error message I'm seeing in my error handler routines is that there's no grammar found. And that, too, should make sense, because there's no spec of a DTD like last week. But now let's take it one step further and do XSD. Huh, didn't seem to do anything. Or did it? Well, here's the schema. Give me a suggestion for how I can break this, my XML instance to be incompatible with this schema. And let's see if my code's really working. OK, so I changed the comment. I heard comment first. Let's say I, want, I need four comments to be silly but specific. So now let's rerun the program. Ah, so there we go. So in the declaration of elements, the value of min occurs is four, but it must not be greater than the value of max occurs, which is one. So. <laughs> I mean, I've frankly never seen more verbose error messages, but the upside is that they're amazingly specific. So uh, they're just printing standard out or standard error, but it's useful, first, to be sure. Yeah? That was the kind of thing about the coherence of the schema, not about the document. Not 
Oh, good point, actually, and I'm not even thinking through. So quite true, because notice now that this is a validation error in the schema, which it means that the processor is validating the schema itself against its built-in understanding of what an XML schema should be. So let's fix this a few different ways. Let's change max occurs to 8, and that should get rid of that problem fundamentally. Now let's see what happens now. OK, so invalid content was found starting with element items. One of comment is expected. So not as precise, but it does suggest that a comment is missing. And that's certainly true. In fact, three, I think, comments are missing, or four comments are missing, because it used to be min occurs equals 0. So if, even if I started adding comment after comment, I'd still get this message until I had at least four of them there. And you can certainly break this code in other ways as well. But the takeaway for now is that validation works just by setting that flag, using, again, code that we've seen now for 10 or so weeks. We've just pulled it back uh, into the rotation. So what, I do, I, what I'll suggest doing, perhaps as an at-home exercise, well, actually, no, let's take a look at a couple of these, because they do illustrate some neat features. But I won't dwell too long, because um, lest we uh, repeat, begin to repeat ourselves. But what you'll see in bookstore, the bookstore directory is a few different examples that we took from, uh, it's referenced somewhere online, which are nice because they incrementally add features to the schema that allow you to specify more and more precisely exactly what your data looks like. They're all based around a file called bookstore.xml. And just to give you a sense of this thing, a bookstore has zero or more books, each of which has a title, an author, a date, an ISBN, and a publisher. So we have some juicy candidates here for um, data specification. Uh, title and author eh, probably just can be a string, most likely, maybe even publisher. But ISBN is a prime candidate for some kind of strong data typing, specifying what the format should be. Date as well, presumably, or which looks like a year, actually, not a date in the formal sense. We can probably spec that out to be something between you know, maybe 1970 and 2070 or whatever my range needs to be, or maybe just a four-digit number is acceptable for my purposes. Who knows? Well, let's see how we can do this. So in each of these example directories, we have incremental improvements on how this might work. And I think we'll drive ourselves crazy if we walk through all of these things line by line by line, but let's take a look at some highlights. And next week, realize that we'll tease apart a bit further this idea of complex type and simple type uh, because you'll see that within the notion of a complex type, which just means an element can have attributes and or children, there are different content models. So rather tragically, next week we'll be look at complex types with simple content, complex types with complex content, and a couple of other things as well, which is uh, quickly gets silly, but at least at the end of the day, it, it, it does get some useful jobs done. So what is? A bookstore. So it looks like it's a sequence of how many books exactly? Yeah, so one or more books. All right, so that seems to be it. What's a book then? Well, a book is a sequence of elements called title, author, date, ISBN, publisher, all of which must be there, but all of which is of a certain type. Um, what are those types for title, author, date, ISBN, and publisher? Strings. So we've really cut all possible corners here and just punted completely. These things are all just strings, which kind of calls into question why we went through this exercise in the first place. But version 2 does a bit better. So again, you do have printouts of these if it's a little tough to read on the screen. But in bookstore, uh, XSD in the examples 2 directory, notice we have now the following. So a bookstore now is again a sequence of one or more book elements. And now we have some namespace prefixing here so that these things end up in this namespace. So just know that you can do this, but we won't dwell on namespaces for this exploration. Um, notice that now we have an element called book, which again is just a sequence of title, author, date, ISBN, publisher, still just of type string. The difference, though, is that these elements now are in the uh, namespace denoted by BK. So the takeaway here is that within your names, within your schema, can you specify um, the namespace to which these elements belong more explicitly? But again, I'd rather we focus for today at least on refining this thing. So let's actually turn immediately to bookstore in the three directory, and now we've got something a little different. So a bookstore now 
is still a sequence of book elements, but really there was no reason last time to be referring to this and referring to that and declaring a book to be of a certain type because we can, also, we can just do this all anonymously, inline fashion, because we're not reusing any of that code. So this is just yet another approach to that same problem. It's getting a little ugly because of all the indentation, to be sure, but notice now that I'm using even fewer lines if only to just tighten the definition of everything, but the data types themselves are still just strings. So versions one, two, and three, effectively equivalent to each other, different syntax, but now we're at least tightening things up. And let's see if we can focus on the data types themselves in our fourth example. In the fourth example, now we have, let's see, and actually let me just double check one thing. Okay, good. Whew. Thought I was uh, painting myself into a corner and the story wasn't gonna end with a nice climax, but it does. All right, so in the fourth example, still cutting corners on strings, but thankfully this thing's getting shorter already. I don't even need to scroll anymore, which maybe is a value itself, but we're trying to at least tell a story to get to a better point uh, for now. So notice now that a bookstore is a complex type consisting of one or more books. Uh, each of those books is of publication, book publication type, which again is as before. So again, a yet fourth way of solving the same problem just using all the building blocks that we've looked at today. And, um, each of these is arguably no better or worse than the others, depending on your goals. But now let's take a look at one that does make the def more precise, namely this guy. So indentation is our enemy here for a moment, but notice now that at the top of this file, I'm declaring a type called ISBN type. It's a little ugly, but darn, it's precise. So an ISBN type is going to be a string at the end of the day, but a string that must look like this pattern. And we saw this feature a bit ago. It's a little crazy looking and long, but notice that a ISBN can either be digit dash, five digits dash, three digits dash, one digit, or one, um, a digit, three digits, five digits, one digit, or this pattern as well. So it turns out there's at least three different formats for an ISBN, and this is handling all three of them. And the vertical bars, which I don't think we saw earlier, as you might guess, allow you to or these things together in regular expression form. Well, what's a bookstore? Same as before. It's a sequence of book elements, one or more, each of which is of a certain type. But now we're finally getting a little more precise. We're specifying that an ISBN is of that type, and a date is of type G year, which is effectively Y, 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 Y. So we've done a little better. And arguably, you could do perhaps better still. But at least now, we've exploited the structure that we should expect in both ISBN and date and done a better job at capturing that. So on to Scamazon. So the teaser for Scamazon is as follows. And I'll do a quick walkthrough of the PDF, even though some of you are presumably still working on Project three, the deadline for which, yep, is on the third, so next week. Um, so there is overlap by design to just give you some flexibility, but it seems to be helpful typically when I say you can do this, you can't do this. A quick walkthrough of the PDF. Yay, nay? Yeah, nay? Okay. Uh, I'm sure you want to be thinking about project four already. Project four is kind of fun. So it's server side again, the context of which is implementing an e commerce oriented site. Uh, among whose feature will be an ability to add items to a shopping cart, remove items from a shopping cart, check out, have your order fulfilled, quote unquote, by a web service, uh, and then generate a PDF-based receipt for the user. So a really soup to nuts kind of implementation that's gonna <coughs> tie together a lot of the stuff we've looked at from DTD to schema to XSL to XSLFO to uh, Java certainly, Java servlets and more Tomcat. So after this project in particular, you should, if you're inclined to do something web-based for your final project, feel all the more confident with the environment, with the configuration, and just generally bootstrapping yourself for that final project. So what's it all about? Well, I'll defer partly to the spec for details, but know that there are gonna be three main pieces to this thing. A catalog servlet, whose purpose in life is to show the user what they can buy and in what types and colors and sizes and the like. A cart servlet, which allows you to manage your shopping cart, remove things, add things, update quantities, and so forth. And then a purchasing web service, which we'll come to in two weeks' time when we look at things like um, 
SOAP and WSDL and this notion of a web service, which is a compelling feature of the web and is largely language independent. And as these arrows suggest, there's some uh, old stuff coming back to us in terms of XSL and the like to, excuse me, to make all of that happen. So let's take a quick look at the PDF. And again, I realize you might not think about this again for a week or two's time, but let me at least urge you, lest you be suffer at the hands of Amazon, that you at least this week take care of number 11. So one of the neat things about Project 4 is that rather than only play in our sandbox environment, so to speak, you'll also be integrating with a real-world web service, so a third-party um, API, namely Amazon's, so that not only can you sell, quote-unquote, products that we give you uh, in your Scamazon website, you can also sell, quote-unquote, products from Amazon's website and integrate with live feeds of their data, the purpose of which is to make sure you start playing and are comfortable in context outside of the course. And frankly, that's what the course is generally all about, actually doing useful things and doing real work of which using a real world API like Amazon is certainly an instance of. But to do so, you need to get an access key ID, a developer account, completely free, but just in case something goes wrong with their servers, their email server is slow to give you your confirmation email, do that now so that you have it tucked away for four weeks rather than waiting to the last minute. So do yourself that favor if you would. All right, so what's this thing all about? Well, we have the following. And for those of you who like to circle, uh, you can do number one, number two, Number three, notice they're all the zero point questions. Okay, number four, number five, and I'll come back for a moment to focus, to uh, point out what you're doing in these. Six, seven, eight, everything short of nine. So everything up through nine can you do starting now in theory as well as next week it's only the web service stuff that you can quite reasonably wait until we actually get to that in class if you're so inclined so let me just hop backwards a couple slots to the two interesting parts so the two main components that you in theory are quite capable of tackling now is the cart servlet and the catalog servlet we provide some specifications as to what these things must do but we're not so specific as to how they do it um, frankly, it's more fun, I think, when you have some design liberties and can just solve a problem rather than being told what it should look like, how it should operate. So we'll leave the design of this interface largely to you to use HTML form elements as you see fit and the like, subject only to the few constraints that we put forth. Um, you'll notice that there's a great deal of code that you seem to be given, which might scare at first. For instance, I'm going to go ahead and run ant. And notice that we're giving you 171 files this time, which compile rather slowly right now. And there we go. So we've compiled 177 files. Fortunately, you only need to look at six of those. So the 171 files are actually Java files that we not even downloaded from Amazon, but generated automatically from Amazon. So the teaser for two weeks from now when we look at web services is that the neat thing about these things called web services is that uh, essentially a site like Amazon can publish its API to the world in a language independent form using an XML file called WSDL, Web Service Description Language. And specced out in that file are the types of functions or methods that the API supports, the types of arguments they expect, and the types of data that they return. We then ran a tool called uh, Axis and fed it that WSDL file as input and said, generate the Java code that will allow me to call this API remotely. So Access is this web, um, this, uh, web service toolkit that, long story short, allows you to generate what's called stub code, that is RPC code, automagically, that will hook into Amazon's code and make it com almost completely transparent to you, the programmer, that all of your queries, like get books, get prices, get reviews is all happening over the network, but you don't even know. It just feels like a local procedure call to you, just a local method call. But if we look at this in the source directory, you'll notice that all of this is in the com, Amazon, and so forth subdirectory, and there are all of these files, all of which were generated 
automagically by this toolkit that we'll introduce in two weeks' time. And it's a neat thing. Um, I've made use of things like this not only with Amazon, but also PayPal has a developer's API whereby you can integrate your own credit card processing setup by interfacing also with their web service like code. Um, so it's quite neat and I think it's quite compelling uh, for a bunch of reasons, one of which is that it's not language dependent. So the stuff we're doing with Amazon's in Java, the PayPal stuff I did was in PHP just because the rest of the site was in PHP and it's it, at its core language independent, which is quite compelling I think, but more on that in two weeks time. In one week's time, we'll look a bit more at schema, a bit more about data type structures, but mostly about types, simple and complex. and round out that exposure. We'll return uh, after that for web services and then the end of the course will almost be upon us. So I'll stick around now for any questions, but otherwise good luck with the rest of project three.